Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Lisa Simmons, and I am the program manager for the community initiative team at Mass Cultural Council. We are very, very excited today to have Michael Bobbitt here, our new executive director, uh, to talk about community related arts and culture, and also really to hear from you about your thoughts, your needs, your ideas for engaging and supporting and creating the delivery of arts and culture in your communities. So we also have Tree who's going to be here to talk to us and give us an update from Mass Creative. But first, for those of you who may just be joining us for the first time, uh, or it's always good to, uh, to go over again who the community's team is and what we do, I just want to take this moment uh, to do that. So we are the Community's Initiative. I am Lisa Simmons, as I said. Louise Cotto is the Cultural District's Program Manager. Mina Kim is a Program Officer. Timothy Pham, Program Officer. Ricky Guillaume, Program Officer. And Veronica Ramirez Martel is also a Program Officer. All here today, if you have questions about your regions or anything like that, feel free to put all of that in the chat because they are here also to answer any questions that you might have. As you might know, we are uh, divided uh, among regions. And so this map is on the website, massculturalcouncil.org. And also if you need it, we can certainly send you this PowerPoint presentation, but it gives you the idea of where we are and where our focus is as program officers and program managers. Uh, the Mass Cultural, Mass Cultural Council, as you know, has many, many programs. The Community Initiative works really closely with all of these programs. The Cultural Investment Portfolio, which many of you probably have connections with as far as project grants, portfolio and gateway. The Cultural Facilities Fund, so supporting those um, arts and culture facilities around the Commonwealth. Creative Youth Development around education um, and creative youth development and education as far as school bus and uh, stars. The artist uh, department doing work with fellowships, traditional arts and folk, uh, as well as looking at fellowships around the traditional arts in our, in our um, state. Universal participation, the UP program, really important around making sure that our cultural organizations and institutions are allowing for universal participation of everyone. And then there's us, the community initiative, which is the local cultural council program, the festivals program, and the cultural districts program that really works closely with communities on the ground, gra grassroots programming to help support arts and culture in those communities. So today, uh, uh, the agenda is we will, as I said, have Tree come talk to us about what's going on with Mass Creative. And then we'll have a great and robust conversation with Michael Bobbitt. So if, again, if you have any questions, um, please put them in the chat. We'll be managing that chat. And, um, and I wanna turn it over to Tree. Thank you. Thank you, Tree. Um, key series with Mass. I get confused with you guys and us. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I know that's a, <laughs> um, masscreative.org, community engagement and organizing. Director, I'm sorry, this is my fourth meeting in a row, so you have to deal with me. Um, but work-wise, uh, what we've been doing is, um, so docket 2105 has now become S2246, which is the Cultural Futures Act, um, which is to put aside 200 million from the aid coming in from Washington, specifically for the recovery of uh, the creative sector. We are still looking for more sponsors on the bill. So I'm going to put a link for more information about the Cultural Futures Act um, and contact your representative to make sure they understand you care and value this as well. Um, the House just um, through their um, budget proposal put in 20 million for arts and culture, which is uh, something we had hoped for. They're debating it in committee now. So if nothing changes, then our work is to thank everybody involved as we wait for the Senate version to come out. Hopefully that version will have 20 million in it as well, in which case our work will be to thank more people. Um, but that is where the current budget is. I, just as a reminder, I believe uh, Governor Baker came out with a proposal of 16 mil 
Um, so 20 is more in line with what we believe our creative sector really needs, especially in non-creative, I mean, non-COVID times, but especially in COVID times. Yes. And I don't know if I'm allowed to share, but Michael has his larger plan of where we should be with that number. And I'm totally on board with that, but I'll let him share that uh, if he chooses. <clears throat> also, uh, in terms of money coming in from Washington, $4 billion is being uh, put aside for local cities and towns. So part of Mass Creative's work uh, is to support advocacy uh, locally in those areas to make sure some of that money is set aside for um, arts and culture. That means to get a head start, if you already have a relationship or if you don't have a relationship, start a relationship with your local um, leaders so that um, money when it comes in and being spent is being spent on the uh, creative sector as well. Um, last two pieces, one is if you guys remember a little time ago, we were trying to push across the economic um, bond bill, uh, which we did. And part of that was to establish a special commission to study the impact of COVID-19 on the creative sector. Um, Mass Creative is sitting on that uh, commission. So anybody who has stories to share or wants to give input, please reach out to uh, Emily, who is sitting on that commission with your story so that she can better support um, that advocacy. And lastly, but not least, is if you guys didn't know, we have a mayoral race this year. Um, Walsh, depending on who you talk to, surprisingly or unsurprisingly, uh, is off to Washington. And so there's going to be a um, vacant seat um, in the next election. And so there are a lot of people who are running. We, CTV Boston, is trying to ensure that whoever becomes mayor prioritizes art on their platform. So we've gath gathered um, a network of over 40 organizations and artists to come together to raise the voice um, and spotlight arts and creativity while centering uh, traditionally marginalized and BIPOC voices. Because um, it's not like getting more money for the sector is a common ground we can stand on. But beyond that, we want to ensure that once the money comes in, it is distributed equitably and uh, all community members have access to the arts. That is a quick snapshot of all the big work that we're doing, and we would love support in any and all of those things. So any further questions, feel free to ask or reach out to me. Thank you, Tree. And are you all still doing your Friday morning um, updates? Yes, um, let me get that link for you. Give me a second. But this Friday, we will have um, our bi-weekly um, webinars, which is basically just a check-in on the news and policy news that is impacting the creative sector. Uh, I'll put that in chat. Uh, it took me a couple of seconds to look it up. Excellent. Thank you so much. And I encourage people, if you can, to jump in on those calls on Fridays, just to give you an idea about what Mass Creative is doing as far as advocacy and how we can all sort of help, um, help in that. So now I'd love to turn it over to Michael and have Michael have Michael say a few words before we jump into Q&A, just to welcome everyone. Um, and then we'll begin. And again, we have um, plenty of opportunity for questions. So please put those questions in the chat as we continue our conversation. Michael. Hi, thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Tree. And thanks to the whole um, Mass Cultural Council staff. It's, a, it's an amazing group. I'm very, very lucky. Um, I'm so happy to see many people that I had met already and to see some new faces. It really is thrilling to, to be here and to be working with you. Um, my background is in theater and dance, but also as a fine artist and an art collector, as you can see. Uh, I also worked in museums. And then in my capacity, in my leadership capacities, I worked um, in different aspects of public-private partnerships or legislation working with um, private institutions, everything from community, community development to um, working with the development world, uh, advocacy work, um, and all sorts of things like that, and race equity work as well. So uh, my little tentacles will be 
spread out throughout the whole, the whole agency. But I'm really happy to be here. I think our communities, groups, and what you are doing on the ground is so important. You know what's happening in your, in your community and you know what your unique needs are. So hearing from you is really super important. I wanna take a moment to highlight what Tree mentioned. We really need your help. We really, really need your help. This is the like hardest year many of us have had. And the more help we get from you, the more we'll be able to get some more funds for the sector. At the moment, we are advocating for $244 million for the arts sector, which is about $215 million more than we normally advocate for. So we really need your help. So that breaks down in a couple of ways. One, as Tree mentioned, we have been advocating for $20 million from the state. Um, that's uh, $1.8 million than we have been funded for the last two years. The house came out and recommended flat at 20 million, which is pretty great. We haven't seen that kind of funding from the house in since the eighties required no amendments and no um, advocating for people to co-sponsor amendments. So that's pretty great. Now I'm meeting with as many senators as I can meet with before they make their decision. I think I met with maybe 20 before by the time this week is out asking for them to support it. Hopefully they'll come out with the same thing, 20 million, so we don't have to ask for amendments and then go through that process. Um, so that's a good thing. So, But if you know people in the Senate, write them, call them, make sure your staff is reaching out to them, make sure your board members are reaching out to them, take Emily and Tree's emails that they send you and forward them to your constituents so that they are writing. The legislation needs to hear from their constituents. There's a reason why churches and restaurants and sporting venues opened before we opened. Um, they were very strong advocates. So we need your help there. So that's 20 million. Then there's 200 million uh, in a bill sponsored by Senator Kennedy um, that directs um, money from Biden's uh, American Rescue Plan um, to the arts and culture sector. So this is a one-time grant to our sector to make up for all the losses and the suffering that you've done this past year. Um, so we need your help with that. We need you to reach out to all your legislators and say, hey, do what Michael Bobbitt says, do what Mass Culture Council says, do what Mass Creative says, I'll give them a 200 million. And the last pot of money is 14 million from the governor and his capital bond um, budget. So we've already been approved for 36 million, I think but it's in a capital bond. So I have five years to advocate to the governor to get that money. So there are two pots of money we're going, it's, so it exists in three pots. One is for arts education. We decided not to go for that because we weren't sure when the schools were gonna be reopened and the field trips were gonna be happening this year. So we're gonna leave that to another year to advocate for that. We are advocating for 3 million for digital money to support organizations that still would be in the digital world. And we're also going for 11 million for capital money to support um, COVID related capital upgrades. So we're going for 14 million. So if you have a direct line to the governor, let him know that we want that 14 million. Again, we have five years to advocate for that whole 36 million, but I need your help. I need your help. I need you to spread the word and make sure people are really um, reaching out to, to, to get that work done. Um, and then I am, you know, the staff, we just came from a five hour retreat talking about all things agencies, figuring out where we're going to put our efforts and energies um, and figuring out what our, our next couple of years looks like. Um, but I'm on the ground reading and listening and meeting to hear from everyone in the state to see what, what we can do. So I'm excited to be here and chat with you and can't wait to hear your questions. Great. Um, so we do have a couple, but I'd love to start, Michael, with first sort of asking you, you talked about um, you coming from sort of a public-private partnership space, and we're always talking um, on the community level about partnerships and uh, the importance of those partnerships. Can you just talk a little bit about that and about the importance of that? I mean, I know for we're also doing some work with municipalities, so that might also be helpful to hear people hear from you talk about that. So one of my first big jobs was director of touring productions for the Smithsonian. So working with this big sort of government entity and how that worked in, 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 the, in the 
pub in the private sector was a big change to sort of see how that bureaucracy works. And then I ran a theater company in Maryland that was on national park land, funded by the county and the state. And so the bureaucracy of all that was a big part of my job. In addition, we were in a suburb of Bethesda. And so I had to work with that city's council to get funding from them, to get recognition, to have different kinds of partnerships. So I had to work on the county level, getting to know the county council and the county executive and working with them to figure out how we get more funding for the arts, how to support the arts, how to support the arts through the 2016 government shutdown and the 2007 and eight, um, nine and 10 financial crisis. So I was, I always put myself in the forefront of those kinds of conversations and, and really worked to sort of make sure we were thinking about the, the whole of the parts. And on the state level, I was on the board, I testified a lot at the state house in Maryland, but also I was on the board for an advocacy group um, so one of the ways I think the community groups can, can support the whole effort is really getting to know your legislators on the local level, on the state level. They have a lot of power. They need to hear from their constituents. They can't support the arts community if they don't hear what the problems the arts community is having. Um, so to me, you all in the community, because I can't be in every single region and nor can the community's teams, um, you all that are in the regions, the more relationships you have with your local councils and the more relationships you have with your local legislators, both in the House and the Senate, is really, really, really important um, to advancing the effort that we want. Like I jokingly said, I want $100 billion million for the arts and culture sector, but I really want $100 billion. Million. And the way I can get that is, is, is you all helping me. I heard that in this state, it only takes five letters from constituents to one legislators before they have to bump it up in their um, in their decision to pay attention to it. So if you can imagine five letters from you all to your local legislation, they have to pay attention. Um, so that's, so Lisa, I don't know if I answered your question, but that's one way you all can help. In addition to that, I think the cultural councils need to sort of get to know the business community. I encourage you to build relationships with your chambers of commerce. Some of you that don't have space um, or, or want uh, a larger pot of money, uh, maybe you can become sort of a, I've, I've heard there's a couple of local cultural councils that are part of banks or housed by banks or the bank is the fiscal, fiscal sponsor, but maybe your chamber of commerce can be your, um, be your partner. Uh, maybe everyone in the chamber can match the money that we give you. Uh, but those kind of relationships are going to be good. So you have the business community working with the um, arts and culture community. Um, and I would also make sure that you are in conversations in your local communities about transportation, about education, about business development and city planning, because all of those could affect the arts and culture scene. And the more you are in those conversations, the better. I was able to work out deals for a couple of theater companies where City planner was having a conversation with the developer. The developer um, wanted more floors on a building. And so I went in and talked with the legislation and convinced them to give the developer more floors in their building in exchange for that developer building a theater next to their building. Um, there was one theater company that needed new space. Um, and so we convinced the city to build them a theater on the side of a, into a parking garage. And then the, the county made money from the parking for the people that went to the theater. So that paid for the building. But all those kinds of creative ideas, uh, maybe your community would do a cigarette tax or a plastic bag tax or five cents on every parking meter goes to the arts and culture. But you, you have the power to have those kinds of conversations in your local communities. I think that's a really great point. And one of the things that um, for, on the communities initiative that we're always talking about is to sort of, we sort of coined it breaking into city hall, right? Is, is making sure that you are part of the, you know, the, the, the end of the year council meeting where you're presenting the work that you're doing in communities and to help to make yourself visible. And I think visibility is a really important part of that. Um, so local cultural councils, cultural districts, festivals, as we said, are a really big part of communities and building culture. And 
I'm, I'm wondering how you would see, how, how, how you see them as really being sort of like maybe the glue to helping us at Mass Cultural Council, really, as you said, um, not only help us do our work advocate, advocacy wise, but really to bringing, you know, arts and culture to, to communities that, that our, all of our grant programs can't necessarily reach, right? But yet, but the importance is, is that they're bringing arts and culture to these communities. Yeah, I mean, well, to, to support us, there's a couple of things I, I could suggest. I mean, you could have a local arts day where you all get together and talk about the arts and culture in your community and what's needed, what happens. I've seen communities do sort of arts breakfasts or like legislative breakfast day where the arts and culture community got together with the legislators in their town um arts advocates advocacy day in your community where you all went to your um, town hall to talk about what you needed in the community but just gathering together and coming up with your top priorities from a community's perspective and then sharing that with the community's team will give us a lot of information about what direction we can take the agency to support you more my dream is to scale it up um, scale up what we're doing to support you all, both in terms of how much money we're giving you and how much money we are offering you for administrative support. Um, but we have to talk about that some more. So one question that did come in, which is could directly related to COVID and as, I mean, we're all really excited about the state opening up again and being able to go outside and celebrate and do all these wonderful things. Um, but uh, someone's asking what protocols and procedures do, you, do we think that cultural organizations should be putting into place about reopening from vaccines and specifically the, their board is interested in policies that if we have any strongly mandated or encouraged staff to be vaccinated or anything? I, I know we don't at Mass Cultural yeah. Council have something that we're saying, but what's your thought on that? Well, we haven't done that kind of work collectively for the field, mostly because each institution has their own specific needs and it's hard to think about like what the valley would do versus what the museum would do versus what the what the um, theater would do or the or the local symphony so i leave that up to you you're probably tracking it and there's also all the unions and stuff like that i leave it up to you because you're probably all tracking it and to follow both state and city town and cdc rules about that um, certainly the priorities are making sure that you're safe and making sure your patrons are safe. You're safe, your staff is safe, and your, and your patrons are safe. Um, we can probably, we may be able to help you connect with other institutions like yours to see what they're doing so you can share best practices. But we pretty much stayed out of both advocating for reopening because, again, the need in our sector is so different. Uh, you know, restaurants are the same. So they can advocate on behalf of the model for restaurants, but our sector is so vastly different. Um, but keep us posted and let us know. I do hope that when we reopen, it's going to be like a Black Friday sale and people are going to be banging down your doors to get in to see your arts. I don't know if that's the case. Or I hope you're planning for, um, you know, a longer sort of scale up. There's the hope that we can be back at 100% capacity by August. I don't know. I think if you're like, I mean, I was running new rep before I got this job. My patron base was much older. So I don't know if they were going to come back right away. Um, so how are you planning over the next year? Also, I've been reading a lot about um, what's happening in, in some of the island countries that have sort of already recovered from COVID. Um, there's a lot of material out there about the world of the physical world and the digital world being sort of a hybrid actually using the term digital. Um, and so how are you incorporating the digital world into your, into your physical world? And, and, and the philosophy is that when we advance technologically, we don't usually go back. So there's no one out there using beta and eight tracks and CDs and stuff like that. We're going more and more into the technology. So I really encourage you all to dig into the technology there was one article I read that said that in a few years, arts consumption that doesn't include the digital world will feel like a throwback and it will start fading out. Um, there's also, I read an article that said that every single arts organization is either going to have their own streaming platform 
or be part of a sort of a group streaming platform. So how are you thinking about that? And what staffing do you need to bring on to, um, to, to cover those costs? We're going to be looking at what we can do financially to help you support those. Uh, and if you have like universities in your areas, talk to them if they have digital departments, but it's something we all need to be thinking about in an innovative way. Let us as artists tell the world what this innovation looks like versus us running to catch up to it. I, right, and I think that that's really important and it goes down, it go, comes back to the whole idea around partnerships, right? And one of the things that we've also been talking about is the cable TV network. Um, that people have in cities and towns and using that. And the, perhaps the idea that when we all do go back outside or inside or whatever, that this hybrid model with technology offers some form of accessibility uh, that maybe, or even audience development around being able to, uh, to bring more people into your space. So I do think that, you know, I know that, I know that Cape Cod this summer is already sold out. You know, as far as like people being able, to, you know, where people are staying. So I think it bodes well for an opportunity for arts and culture. So let's hope that that, that, that continues. Um, I'm wondering too, so someone else had a question about um, some of our programs. And one of them is the artist program and the artist fellowship program. And I know that we are, are going to be looking at all of our programs going forward. And like you said, we just had a great staff meeting about that. But the question is, is MCC, is Mass Cultural Council sort of thinking about doing a, a other grant programs or something in recognition of individual artists? Yes. <laughs> yes. No, I, you know, the Artist Fellowship uh, only funds about 4% of our applicants, which means that we are not serving the field well. And so we are going to figure out how we can find more money or move money around so that we are funding artists. I'm hoping I can get this new program launched next year. Um, I know Sorry. that there's talk about, uh, well, there's some, a bunch of talks, but I absolutely, I'm sort of obsessed with artists. So um, <laughs> I want to make sure I am funding you all even more. I know that some of the relief grants were so great this year and we just love being able to do that. And we want to continue, find a way to continue that. So keep your eye out for it. And, and in that vein, can you talk a little bit more about, about the grants that may be coming in? So like you talked about the, um, would that be sort of like with, for individual artists or organizations like the American Recovery Act? So if we get the 20 million, that, that gives us a little bit more money to support, um, to support a, a new program like artist funding. But we have to have a conversation about how that additional 1.8 will be used. We're tomorrow, we're finding out about how the National Endowment for the Arts American Recovery Act uh, money will be spent. We don't know what their parameter, we sort of know about how much we're gonna get from them, but we don't know what their parameters are. We do know they have been thinking about race equity in that grant making. Um, so we'll find out more about that tomorrow. Um, the, um, the, the capital money for the capital money we're going after is only for institutions. One is the digital money, COVID related um, uh, capital upgrades, and then our regular cultural facilities fund. Um, the 200 million, it is the most, one of the most comprehensively written um, sort of proposals that really looks at um, individuals, organizations, for profits, nonprofits with priorities given to. Geographic, um, uh, geographic diversity, racial diversity, um, need-based. It's I really like the way that grant is written. So if we get some of that money, hopefully everyone's going to get something. Yeah, I think that that's I think that that's really important um, that we understand that it's not just necessarily organizations and individual individual artists, but also community. It's like our local community, like our local cultural councils. Um, you know, to be able to take advantage of something like that and to be able to fund them in, you know, in a, in a higher, in a higher way would be wonderful. So one of the things too is, as you know, we have a festivals program um, and uh, we're also taking a look at that program as well. But one of the things that we've always sort of like, we fund a lot of film festivals. Um, and one of the questions that came in 
um, from the audience was wondering whether or not, and I think this also goes to funding individual artists, is funding support for independent filmmakers that oftentimes fall outside of sort of like some of the guidelines. And so someone was just asking if we had a plan. I know that the festival's program does, the artist fellowship has a film program, but I'm thinking that this probably would fall within the individual artist grants. Yeah, I mean, I, we talked earlier today, I want to scale up the festivals too, because I think when we look at, when we talk about space and arts consumption, we don't know when indoor space will be completely safe, even though they're saying end of August. They're also saying that we might have to get a booster shot in the summer, and they're also saying we might have to get an annual shot in the summer, so we could see, I mean, COVID is here forever, so we don't know yet. To me, a better place to put more investment is in outdoor programming like the festival. So I'm hoping I can bump up that kind of commitment as well. But our funding is finite. So bumping up one area may mean taking back from somewhere else. Um, so we have to look at all that together. And then John had a question about um, facilities fund. John, right. it, yeah, new facilities can also apply for um, the cultural facilities fund. And that's a great, and that's in all, for local cultural councils, that's a great way for them to look at that as well. I know that we're talking a lot to um, at Mass Cultural Council about race, equity, inclusion. And, you know, we had those listening sessions and we heard some wonderful things from the field and what the field is really hoping to do over the course of the next couple of years. And just sort of wondering if you have any thoughts about how the local cultural councils, cultural districts, um, even festivals can be thinking about approaching this work um, and maybe even focusing if you can think about it in the terms of like public benefit. Yeah, so we're looking at not only our internal processes just operationally, but also our programs and how and what services we're offering. But also our grant making, um, we, we need to look at that. The world is in a state of public outrage and crisis about race equity, and we have to be responsive to that. And in my mind, <clears throat> arts and culture is a health and human service. And so like the in health and other health and human services, like in food and housing and, um, and all those kind of programs, they're offering support to people that are in targeted, oppressed, and vulnerable communities. So the arts have to also be responsive to that too. Externally, we're also going to look at how can we support you all to be to, to help you sort of build anti-racist organizations or come up with new best practices in that way as well. And I think what that'll mean is that we'll we'll have some recommendations for local cultural councils too in, in how you do grant making that is racially equitable. I think that's really helpful. Um, one of the things that... Uh, that we know for the local cultural council program. And also, I mean, this is very true in community work, as we know, a lot of times it's volunteer. Um, and, you know, so, and there's a lot, there's a lot going on. There's a lot for our local cultural councils to be doing. We're so thankful for the work that they do in the communities. And there's always been this sort of question about whether or not local cultural councils can get stipends, um, you know, even smaller stipends. And unfortunately, the statute doesn't allow that. Uh, but there are, um, but there are opportunities for, for cultural council members to like use administrative funds or something like that. So someone had asked a question of whether or not we local cultural councils could do that, because of the, a lot of the work that people are doing around volunteering for their local cultural council. Yeah, I wish we just had a good conversation about that yesterday that um, that it would be fantastic to be able to offer stipends to our council members. Um, but in the statute, the legislation that was written, the, the council members are volunteer non paid appointed position so for us to offer a stipend, we have to go back and get and, and advocate to rewrite the statute. And I think that would actually open up every kind of volunteerism appointment for the whole state. So I, I don't think we'd get far with that kind of legislation, legislative change. But I think what we've been talking about is really looking at the structure of the local cultural councils, which I think is like the coolest network I have seen in um, sort of grant making, like to have 351 
local cultural councils is amazing. 329, so, 351 cities and towns. Oh, 329. Um, I think that's an amazing idea. And so I want to make sure that the structure supports all the things we want you to do. Right now, we we're asking a lot of our volunteers, not only into the, in the grant making, but we're also asking you to infuse yourself in the local, um, the local um, legislative process and, and, and recruit or all these agencies. So we're asking a lot of you with, with not a lot of resources. So one of the things, that, one of the thoughts I had was, can we support you all more with some more administrative money to help with whatever administrative needs you have? But that's a, a long conversation we need to have. But at the moment, sadly, we can't do stipends for volunteers because it'll be against the law. We don't want to do that. Yep. Someone did ask though whether or not you we would we could provide stipends within the community that are outside the cultural council, and that and that really could be somebody applying for a project grant, or I mean, there are probably ways to be able to do that, and maybe that comes back to partnerships. That you yeah, I mean, I think when we have this strategic conversation, all ideas will be on the table to figure out how we can set you up for um, for success. Right, exactly. So um, are there any questions that you might have for our, uh, our audience about sort of what they're doing or, um, and someone's asking right now, which is really interesting, whether or not we can erase the amount of festivals above $500. Yes, fingers and toes crossed. <laughs> That's the goal, yes. I mean, we did have a conversation about that. We know that um, we know that oftentimes festivals are run by volunteers as well, and there's a lot of work that goes into that. And we were and with the festivals grant, um, we're we're really be looking at that. So thank you for that question. So outside of the NEA, there's a little bit of money from a private donor for a specific program that we run. The rest of the money we get is from the state. It's an appropriation from the tax dollars that are generated through income tax. Um, there is there is more. There's another pot of money that comes from um, the casinos. We get two percent of casino revenue, but that's it. That's it. So my option is to get more money from the state, or find other designated revenue sources like the casino money. Um, so for me to give more money and to grow the pot, I just need to get more money in, which is where we go back to your advocacy efforts. The more I hear from you, the more it's easier for me to walk in the room and say, give me 100 billion million dollars because my people need it. Right. And someone was asking whether or not they, the idea is that they advocate as a group or they advocate as individuals. Uh, both. Both is always good. Right. Collective impact is always very good. Consensus organizing is always really good. So what is it that, um, you know, we would love to hear from people on the call about what things that you might need that you would like to see Mass Cultural Council, um, how you would like Mass Cultural Council to be supporting you in your efforts around all of the incredible community-based arts and culture work that you're doing. Um, and I see that Karen from Springfield posted something uh, in the chat uh, about a, a partnership convening that they're doing. I think that's also a great way for you all to connect in some way um, and, to, and to build partnerships across regions and across cities and towns. And so we're, while we're waiting, um, so there's a question that just came in. When you say festivals, is this the Shakespeare festival that the schools do and then compete? So I'm not sure about, so we, so the festival funding uh, is really a eligibility based and you really have to just pass the eligibility quiz in a sense, and then you're automatically funded. So the Shakespeare festival, uh, if, unless it, if it's just a school-based program, then it's not, and it's not eligible. But if it's a, if it's a festival that the school does that is open to the public, and the public can take part in that, um, then that festival would be eligible. 
So and we just put some more information in the chat for that. One thing I would tell you is that we are going to be implementing a new grants management system, which is going to make everybody's life so much easier, both internally and externally. There'll be a onboarding process that'll be a pain in the ass, but uh, once we get through it, it's going to be great. Uh, and then we're having really great conversations about um, the fact that our grant making is a customer service and that, and therefore it should be really, really, really easy for you to get money from us. So we're going to go back and really streamline how much work we are asking of you, both in terms of the application process, but also the reporting process. So that, you know, my goal is no more than an hour to fill out all of our grant applications. Um, that is a, right? You would like that? We all like this idea? Okay. <laughs> This is the good part about having run nonprofits is that I can help you all with that. I have empathy for you. Right, I think that that's a really good point because oftentimes it's really right the benefit of getting the getting the funds you know against the time it takes to fill out that application. So that's the difference great. in is the difference. We should make it easy. Is the difference in um, self check in at an airport, which is pretty easy, which is why most people use it and self-checkout at the grocery store, which is so hard, right? That is very true. Um, so I have a question. So where there are so many people that are doing all sorts of arts and culture work in communities, foundations, um, planning folks, and Mass Cultural Council is there on the, on the ground every single day and doing that work. How do we sort of envision working with other folks that are in the in the regions, in the communities, doing arts and culture work along with us? We create a monopoly and call it an <laughs> empire and absorb all of them. And <laughs> no, I don't know. I think I think partnerships is a big part of the way I do my work. And so hopefully we can find those key partnerships and figure out how we get, get everyone on the same page about it all. I'd love to hear from you all. What, what I know. needs you have? Well, we still have that. We have another question about supporting individual artists and um, sort of what we're doing more to be supporting individual artists, which I think you talked about in our, we just had the $10 million grant for individual artists and we're thinking more about providing grant programs for individual artists. Yeah, uh, well, I can say a couple of things. One is I, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of project grants um, because to me, you're already doing a lot of projects. So I just rather give you general operating money and you can use it for whatever you want to use it for. If you want to do use a project, do a project with it. Um, and so same thing for individuals. I'm, I don't feel like, I, I don't feel the need to have an individual artist present something at the end. They're going to do that anyway. So what I'm hoping is that when we create this grant fund for individuals, it would just be sort of an individual artist general operating grant mm -hmm. so that the individual can use it for whatever they want to use it for, a food, rent, a project, up to them. Um, similarly, one of the other things we're talking about is that we fund capital projects, we fund projects, we fund general operating, but we're not funding some of the other sort of capacity building things that you all need. Like if you, as an individual, if you need a website or new equipment or um, consulting with a finance advisor, we are, I want to make a, a pot of money for that. For organizations, if you need to buy new computers or software or hire a consultant for marketing or DEI or professional development or add another staff person. So I'm hoping we can add a, another grant um, line item for what I call capacity building grants. I think those will help you grow um, your organization, your businesses as well. And it's, yeah, I think that that, that would be amazing. And I think another interesting, very interesting question that Daniel G Callian just put in, and I think it's something that the community team is trying to do around like putting, pulling together regions and having regional convenings, but is do, would there be any focus funding for cross district, cross neighborhood initiatives, um, connecting communities, which you know, so we don't have such a segregated commonwealth. It would mean we have to build it and find the money to cover the cost for it, but open to all ideas. 
and then about mass development and our work with mass development and whether or not that plays into cultural districts or cultural districts that would be supported by mass development and I don't know Luis but I am I have a monthly meeting with um what's the CEO my brain is mayor is it Daniel I'm sorry my brain is mushy but we have a monthly meeting we're Mark. just we're having new brainstorming ideas about how mass development and mass culture council can do more uh, for the arts sector. So keep your ears out for that. Uh, and then someone was asking about the potential of capacity building grants. Someone's asking any timeline on that. We are in the budgeting process now. Today, um, our full staff retreat was really sort of the launch of the budgeting process. They're actually going, going away to start looking at um, their programs for next year and building out how they're gonna program next year. And then they'll start putting money against that. Um, I've told them all to dream big and put everything in the budget that you want, even the kitchen sink. That way I know sort of what it takes to run the business. And then we'll probably have to negotiate because our funding is finite. The, the amount of money we get is finite. So uh, hopefully that will stay in there. Great. And one of the things that we, that communities has also been closely working with, because we know that there's a library in every community, right? And so uh, the question is, does, M does, does our universe include libraries statewide? And I would say yes, because we work on the community level. We work with libraries and a lot of the local cultural council programs that happen, oftentimes happen in libraries. So I do know that um, that uh, grantees, uh, organizations work a lot with their local libraries. And of course, this year during COVID, we know that's been a little difficult, um, but hoping that those libraries can keep opening up because they're such an important. The, there's a question, are libraries part of our world? Right. They are. They are in that they are in the sense that they are that that local cultural councils and cultural districts I think also work really closely with libraries and um, and we fund uh, programs that use the libraries as venues. So there um, there's also a question from Aaron about their dance troops. Aaron, the only thing I would say is and, um, Aaron said that it's hard to get permissions to perform outdoors in public spaces. This is another mm. reason. This is another reason why the more you get involved with your local legislation the easier it's going to be to get those rules changed or to, I mean, honestly, you, you want to be able to walk in town hall and they go, Oh my God, there's Michael again. Michael, what do you want? What do you need? What can we give you? Because you are just that present. Um, so, I mean, put them on your opening list, put all the legislators on your opening list, have them write proclamations. They love writing proclamations and giving them in front of public because they give them some time in front of their constituents. But all those things you do for donors, do for your local legislators. Um, all that work will help you all get more um, inroads in your communities. Great. Okay. Um, and so people are just talking about libraries because they are really very important. And we do have a great, com you know, there are great um, cross collaborations with cultural districts and local cultural councils. Uh, that work really well to support communities. And so we know who you are. We know that you're doing that work. Um, so yeah, so if there are no further questions that you we have. Pop, you can pop off mute and ask a question if you have. Right, so just jump in if you have any questions. I'd love Hi, to Carolyn Cole. You. Can Carolyn Cole sing us a song <laughs> on the way out? <laughs> I'm gonna get my song, Carolyn. <laughs> Do you have any grants for that, Michael? <laughs> she, said, I don't sing. she said, I don't sing for free. <laughs> I do, actually. I do a lot. It's okay. Uh, amazing. <laughs> Good to see you, too. Anyone pop off and ask any questions? Karen? Karen? 
I, I put a question in there, and it sounds like a very silly problem, but all I want to do is to get our, st uh, our, our chorus is a community-based chorus, and our festival is um, uh, in collaboration with several other uh, Worcester area uh, choruses. And uh, so I know one of the stipulations of the grant, uh, the festival grant, is, is, is that we have to advertise in Arts Boston, which we would love to do. Um, but the problem is, is they will only accept things that are in the Boston area, but we're via Zoom, and they have no contact person. I just don't know how to get around it to get our information on their website. And I, so, I know it's not your problem really, but I don't know how to do well, it. It is, it is ours. Um, and so the festival program, one of the things that we did when we started working with Arts Boston was to make sure all of that was waived. So oh, okay. yeah, so you don't, so that's one of the great things um, that you do not have to be a Boston or Greater Boston Festival. You can be any, yeah. So that that is waived, and they and it's just part of their website. So put it on there. Put them all on there. Put all your festivals and all of your events uh, on Arts Boston. Thank so you. That would be much. great. Thank you. I, I know it's ridiculous, but I just couldn't. No, it's not. It's a good question because it's one of those technical questions that could, like, you know, be that last draw. <laughs> we don't want you to get to that point. <laughs> Feel free to pop off mute if you have another question. I have a question. Um, is there a way to have um, kind of volunteers, lawyers of the art, or a, su a better support for legal things? Uh, for or, you know, like I, we used to have a volunteer lawyer of the art, but he died, and then trying to find another one is like, oh my god. And I have like a question, maybe like twice per year. Like, how do we do this? Is there a way, like a we can get a support uh, from the Massachusetts Cultural Council? Um, that's a good question. I mean, we, we hire them to do workshops for us, mm -hmm. but they're a business in and of themselves. So I doubt they'll, they, would, they would do, I mean, it's something to talk about. Let me, let, me, let me run that over, see if I can put them on retainer. I don't know, I don't know. I don't wanna say anything right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but it's to um, keep it in mind that for us, we run with so little money. And, and sometimes we work like a, only two people for a whole organization. And then we have the cap of the, you know, the cleaning lady, the, the one who do right. the grants, the one who do the uh, recruiting, the criminal records, everything. And, right. and then when we have like a, a, a legal thing, like, oh no, uh, that's uh, one more thing. So, well, yeah. most, most law firms will, especially the major ones will do pro bono counsel for you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I, when I moved from, from Maryland, I brought the DLA Piper up here cause they had an office up here and they gave me a team. They gave me a general counsel who of course has access to anyone else in the, in the, in the law firm. But I wouldn't, I think that's, those are, those are the kinds of cold calls I think you can make. Just say, hey, I'm a local nonprofit. Mm -hmm. I'm just looking for pro bono legal advice. Mm -hmm. You can, um, they, their pro bono counsel can be a, a sort of a corporate gift, sort of a tax write off. And I see Dave okay. Slater is listening in the background. Dave may be able to um, correct yeah, I, I, I believe, and I don't know what uh, city or town your organization is in, but Arts and Business Council of, um, they're based in Boston, but I thought they had gone uh, statewide. And if you do contact them, they do have a list of volunteer lawyers. They will put your your request online and seek out volunteers for people that might, you know, help you at either free or reduced rates, depending on what the type of uh, the type of legal services needed. And if they don't service your region, they might have some suggestions about organizations uh, that could be helpful as well. So. I also say another great opportunity to reach out to your local culture, your local legislators, because most legislators are in law for, of some sort. So they might suggest people that they know, but I would look in your communities because that's another relationship in the community that you can build. Oh, okay. Thank you. One other thing too, mm -hmm. Katalina, is that this is also a perfect opportunity for not only for local cultural councils, for organizations, when you're thinking about bringing on board members or you're thinking about bringing on council members, yes. to be really thinking about someone who might be able to fill, help fill that role for you, which mm -hmm. is also a good opportunity to bring them on. Okay, good idea. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. I have one quick question. Hi, Michael, Kristen Moriarty from Shakespeare and Company in the Berkshires. Um, we are 
thinking a lot about as we're furthering our idea work and um, trying to do more for race equity, when it comes to job postings, we're trying to attract people who are underrepresented in the arts, especially in arts administration. And is there any talk on any kind of platform to, uh, to post jobs among the um, local or state cultural entities? We have one, it's called higherculture.org. Okay. And it's free to you all, so you can post on there if you want. But let me give you all some suggestions for how to make your job postings um, uh, look better to attract people of color. One, if you don't have a race equity statement, create one and lead your job descriptions with that race equity statement. So put it before your mission and vision, put it at the top. And the philosophy behind this is that most of us put it at the bottom, all ethnicities encouraged, but if you're a white presenting organization, people of color may not even like think about reading your, your job. So put it at the top. It says to, to people of color, this is important. Secondly, get rid of your qualifications. Get rid of anything that might be othering. You don't need that in your job posting. You can ferret that information out in the interviews, right? Or, or, or when they sub submit. But when you put things like advanced degrees or years of service, one, we have to think about the racial equity that is because of those things. But when you put it there, you just limit the pool of applicants that may apply. So I would encourage people to take out things like years of service, advanced degrees, and even specific software, because if they can fill out a resume, they can do software, right? Um, but take those things out. I think your qualification should be based on the culture, like must love art, must be fun, must not be an asshole. Those kind of things I think are important <laughs> because that's what you want to hire to the culture. And the last thing I would suggest is that this whole idea of, of um, cover letter and resume is just a dated thing. And we're all in the arts field. So to me, I would say put something like, send us whatever you want to send us to show us why you're right for this job. And then let them be creative, right? I had one person that applied and they had 27 people send me video recommendations. I was like, 27 people that I know? I want to hire that person. And then last thing, make sure you post your payment. Make sure you post it. It doesn't mean you can't negotiate, but make sure you post it. Yeah, we've actually made almost all of those changes, nine out of 10 of those changes over the last <laughs> months and have seen a, a great difference in our applicant pool. Um, and so the, we just want to make sure that we're also making sure that we're showing our job posting to people who wouldn't normally be seeing it also. We're so also, we also fund the Network for Artists Administrators of Color, is that what it's called? And they have, they, they will post your job posting. So if you want to send it to anyone on the community's team, they'll forward it to Carmen in our, in our place who will, Carmen might be there. You can send it to Carmen Plazas everyone. Yeah, hi, we'll I'm here. Uh, I'm going to put my email on, on the chat so you guys can send it directly to me. Thank you so much. Excellent. Well, we're at the end of our hour. Unfortunately, this has been, I know, we'll bring, Michael will come back. Um, this has been so inspiring, so incredible. Michael, thank you so much for joining us. Tree, always thank you for enjoying us and updating us on Mass Creative. The whole community's team that's here, uh, supporting you every single day. Uh, you, if you're an LCC, you know who your program offices are. If you're a cultural district, you know Luis is here consistently and constantly for you. We are so lucky to work with you um, and support the work that you're doing on a daily basis. And um, shout out if you need us. If you have, if you're thinking about things after this, um, after this conversation, email us and let us know. As Michael said, we're building our you know, we're going through a strategic plan. We're doing all sorts of things at Mass Cultural Council. We want to make sure that um, that you're included in that. So I want to say thank you, Michael. I don't know if you want to take us out and just. Yeah, I'm hoping to, as things get safer, I'm hoping to start sort of touring the state um, over the summer. And my plan is to um, prioritize rural, smaller, and BIPOC organizations and then work my way towards bigger organizations and organizations in big cities. So I won't get to see you all this next year, but hopefully in the next two years, I get to visit everyone. But I'm so great to see you all and share any ideas you have and we will um, stay in touch. Thank you all.